have a look at the electromagnetic induction section of the physics syllabus. So firstly, when we think back to electromagnetism, we remember that if you had a current carrying conductor with the current flowing, your current would produce a magnetic field around your conductor. Now we look at the fact that a magnetic field can cause a current to move within a conductor. So if we look at a diagram such as this one, where we have a magnet and we have a coil of current carrying conductor, the magnet creates a magnetic field inside the coil and the magnetic field causes our electrons in the coil to move and therefore current moves in the coil and our light at the top here would light up. So first important um, concept for this section is magnetic flux. When we look at magnetic flux, our magnetic flux density, shown by the B symbol, is a representation of the magnitude and direction of the magnetic field or the field strength. Now that, that's the field strength of the magnetic field in which our conductor is placed. So magnetic flux, which is indicated by this symbol right over here, same as this one down here, is the account of total magnetic field through an area. So simply you can think of it as the count of the magnetic field lines through an area. So it's the amount of magnetic field or the scale of magnetic field moving through an area. So as I've said, it's the total number of magnetic field lines moving through an area. So when we look at magnetic flux measured in Weber's WB, it is our B, so our magnetic flux density, which is our field strength, as we've said, times our area in meters, so in meters squared, remember your units, you must always use meters squared, times cos of our angle made between our magnetic field and our conductor. Remember, if they ever give you your area in centimeters squared, to get to meters squared, you simply divide by 10,000. So when we talk about theta, in our cos theta being the angle, theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the normal to the coil, or the normal to the area through which the magnetic field lines are flowing. So if we look at, a, at an example such as this, where theta equals zero because our normal to our coil is parallel to our magnetic field lines, our magnetic flux density, as we've spoken over here, our magnetic flux is our maximum. As our angle gets larger, as we approach 90 degrees, our magnetic flux gets smaller. And when we hit 90 degrees, our magnetic flux is zero because we know the cos of 90 is zero. And therefore, our magnetic flux from our calculation over here would be zero simply because cos of 90 is zero. Now, that makes sense because magnetic flux is the measure of the number of field lines flowing through an area. So over here, we can see we've got the maximum number of field lines flowing through this coil. Over here, that is decreased. We've got fewer. And over here, we have absolutely none as our magnetic field lines are flowing parallel to the surface of our coil. And our normal is at 90 degrees to our field lines. So when there's more than one loop in the coil, we look at magnetic flux linkage. So if you were to have one loop in your coil or one loop of current carrying conductor, you would talk about magnetic flux. Whereas if we have more than one loop of coil, we look at magnetic flux linkage. Now magnetic flux linkage is simply the product of the number of turns on the coil and the magnetic flux through the coil. So this would be your magnetic flux linkage. So obviously the more loops we have, the more concentrated our magnetic field becomes. If we look at now electromagnetic induction, so we have a wire or a coil over here in all of the diagrams, and we have a galvanometer over here measuring our current. So the movement of the magnet in coil or around the coil produced a current. So as you can see, as we move a north pole with the south pole, so a magnet up towards the coil, we produce a current. As we pull it away, we produce a current. As we move it through the coil, we cause another current. And as we move it away, we cause a further current. However, when it's stationary, as we see over here, if we simply hold the magnet in between the coil, there is no current. Nothing will happen. 
there are there's no movement of field lines and therefore there is no induction of a current so the direction of your current depends on your poles we use our right hand solenoid rule so you have your thumb pointing to your north pole so so firstly we need to understand that when we when we put our magnet towards the coil we will learn this later on in the lesson but as we move our magnet towards the coil the coil will induce a current so as to set up a magnetic field to oppose the magnetic field of the incoming magnet so as we move a north pole up towards it the coil will create a current so as to produce a north pole at the bottom to oppose the north pole coming from the magnet so in that case it would produce a north pole and using our right hand rule we see that our current will move this way around the coil in the same way when we move a magnet away from the coil the coil will produce a pole in order to attract the magnet because it wants to resist a change in the magnetic field in the coil so it wants to remain at the point that it is now and it doesn't want to lose that magnetic field so it tries to attract the magnet and therefore would create a south pole to attract the north pole which is being pulled away and therefore using our right hand rule we see that our current will move in a anti-clockwise direction now when we look at the ways in which we can change the amount of current or the scale or quantity of current flowing through the coil we can use a logic area of coil that will increase or give us greater current if we use a greater number of coils we will increase our current if we use a stronger magnet so we increase our magnetic flux density we will increase our current and if we move our magnet through our coil or around our coil at a faster speed or a rate then we will increase our current flowing through our current carrying conductor now if we look at a magnet we know that magnetic field lines go from north to south and if we look at a typical magnet our magnetic field lines would look something like this so as flux constantly changes as our magnet moves we can see that the distance between our field lines changes at different points around our magnet they are not always uniform and therefore our flux is constantly changing as we move through a coil at any point in the coil at any point in time your flux will be different as your field lines will be at different positions at different times now as i said we would come to this law which allows us to work out the direction of current in our coil when we move magnets it's called faraday's law now faraday's law is the EMF induced is directly proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux. Now, this determines the size of the EMF induced in your current carrying conductor. So your EMF is the energy that causes your current to flow in your current carrying conductor is equal to negative N being the number of turns on your coil times your change in magnetic flux. So it's your final flux minus your initial flux over your change in time we must know that emf is directly proportional to n as we said from over here if we increase our number of coils we increase our emf that is directly proportional it is also directly proportional to our change in flux and we know that our emf is directly proportional to one over our change in time so therefore if we decrease our time therefore moving it faster our emf increases now we must know that the negative sign in our formula is simply the emf induced creates a current to oppose the changing flux so then we look at lenz's law to work out the direction of movement of the current in the current current conductor so Lenz's law states that the induced current flows in the direction so as to set up a magnetic field to oppose the change in magnetic flux. So as I said, we use Lenz's law and the right hand vector rule to predict the direction of current. So let's look at an example such as this. As the North Pole approaches the coil, the magnetic flux through the coil increases. This is due to Faraday's law and the EMF is induced due to the change in magnetic flux from the magnet. Lenz's law states that current will be in the direction to create an opposing magnetic field. As we can see, 
as the North Pole approaches, a North Pole is formed on the closest side of the coil. Now we use our right hand solenoid rule. We place our thumb where the North Pole of the coil is, and our fingers curl in the direction of the current around the coil. Therefore, we can see it is anti-clockwise, and that is how we work out our direction of current. In the same way, if we were to picture this magnet being inside the coil and now being pulled away, your coil would produce a south pole closest to us, or the closest side to us. To, in order to oppose the change in flux, it would try and attract the magnet, and therefore we would point our thumb away from us and the current would flow in a clockwise direction, in the direction that our fingers curl, and therefore would flow in the opposite direction. So each time you need to see where your magnet is moving, what the coil would do, where it would set up its poles, and in that way you use Lenz's law to then determine the direction of your flow of current in your coil.